Hi everyone, once again, I'm Francesco, the director of Silicon Roundabout, one of the organizers of these events that have been going on for nearly a decade now. Uh, don't know how many of you know us already, uh, but just to give you a little intro on who we are, if you have not come to our events before, uh, or even if you have and forgotten, uh, we are the largest tech meetup in Europe. We're called Silicon Roundabout, and we've probably been part of the London tech scene for longer than most people remember now. And uh, we've been doing events, uh, mostly live meetups, for getting engineers, founders, angel investors, and people in the startup community to just connect. Uh, and we've been doing this since 2011 uh, through, like I mentioned, mostly our meetup, which is free to join for everyone and where we post all of our events. And uh, the meetup has now grown to over 14,000 uh, members, nearly 15,000 now, like I said, you know, the largest tech uh, meetup in Europe. And uh, we wouldn't be here without you. So thank you for joining events like this. Uh, today, in particular, uh, we're going to talk about tech recruitment for startups because uh, we've done several surveys through the, the years and together with raising seed capital, uh, finding good engineers and connecting to the right people and building the right product and scaling up the team seems to be one of the biggest challenge, especially for early stage startups when they're competing with big guns companies that can just sort of overpay everyone. Um, and on the other side, of course, I'm an engineer myself. I was one of the reasons we started this meetup was to again connect to uh, tech founders and really foster the ecosystem. So uh, again, for also people like me, uh, especially when I was actually coding, uh, most of my time it was great to find interesting, nice, exciting technologies to work on and build, uh, and therefore to meet the founders that were working on them. Uh, so Silicon Roundabout today also has a website that you can join. If you're a startup uh, founder, you can just sort of register there and uh, you might just basically be picked up to present live at our events. There's no cost to that. Uh, we just do it for the community. Uh, and on top of that, we're now working on launching our first venture fund, which is why I've left software development for the last uh, year and a half. Uh, and I've been focusing on Silicon Roundabout to, uh, with the goal of hopefully next year, uh, be able to fund the most exciting tech projects. And as we were doing all of these things, the community kept growing bigger. And like I said, one of the biggest challenges startups were facing and are facing is hiring talent, is talking to real engineers and on the other side of the spectrum for engineers to meet the right startups. And then, you know, there's this kind of barriers. How do we facilitate that uh, to, uh, to do this more effectively? For now, over a year, we've had a great, uh, great, 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 great uh, supporter of, of this mission of helping startups in this specific field, uh, Mustafa, who will be leading today's workshop. Uh, and he will be talking exactly how to maximize uh, the chances of meeting engineers, proposing yourself, pitching your brand as a startup, because effectively, uh, that's what you'll have to leverage, right? You know, if you're a startup, you're not a large company, corporation, you're not gonna compete with lar large banks uh, on contractors with salary. You're going to try and get your brand out there uh, and really show the value of your technology. Uh, and so to go back to today's topics, now that you all know what Silicon Roundabout is about, uh, I'll just uh, leave Mustafa to take over. So that's pretty much all from me. Uh, if you do have any questions on the communities or anything like that, and you want to just reach out, uh, our email is hello at siliconroundabout.tech. Like I said, uh, you can just join the meetups if you haven't done yet, uh, submit to present at our future events. Uh, and you can connect to me on LinkedIn, Francesco Perticarari. I think I'm the only one with that long Italian name in London. Uh, so do reach out. Uh, please add a message, tell me what is it about, because otherwise I might just not see it and accept, uh, but as long as you, you know, you're a startup founder, you're an engineer, when I connect, just tell me what it's about and uh, we can chat there. Other than that, it's all me done. I'll just sit back and relax and like all of you, enjoy uh, Mustafa or like we call him here, Safi, take over the stage uh, and really uh, share a little bit of his, um, of, his, of his expertise with us. So Mustafa, are you all ready? I'm alive. Uh, I, first, okay, two things. I cannot share my camera so that the, 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 the guys can't actually see me. Uh, I can fix that for you. 
if you can fix that, please. Uh, cool. Go for it. Awesome. Hello. Nice to meet you, everyone. Uh, I'm actually coming to you from our um, uh, Liverpool Street office. We work. I've decided to come in here for those who uh, missed the start of this uh, webinar uh, for the first time in seven months. I have not worked outside my home for seven months. Uh, it feels great. It's nice. Liverpool Street is absolutely deserted. It's hilarious. There's literally three people in the office today. Uh, but it's nice. It's nice. Um, cool. So what we're going to do today is exactly as the uh, uh, as, as the, 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 the title of the event suggests, hiring, COVID or non-COVID. The whole idea is I'm going to give you guys a crash course, literally a crash course within the next hour or even less now um, on how you can hire but a few things i must highlight at the very very start before i start sharing my screen and going through, through the presentation if you think by the end of today that's it we know wrong i'm sorry to say there isn't it's not going to happen there's no magic formula magic button it, there isn't anything like that okay but today we'll give you a lot of it right that you probably wouldn't know, you, you'd you have difficulty reaching uh, or finding, basically. So let's get right down to it. Uh, also, I'll be leaving uh, about 10 minutes or so in the end, uh, a chance to um, uh, for you guys to ask any questions. Um, sorry, bear with me a second. Who can share all panels? Only host. Um, Okay, um, I don't know why it's not letting me share my screen. One second. There we go. I think. Can everyone see? Uh, Francesco, if you can't see, then everyone yep. else, you can. Yep, I can confirm that you're all sorted. Cool, fantastic. Uh, guys, Francesco's obviously monitoring the chat. If you cannot see, drop us a message in the chat. Uh, we'll try and fix that. Yeah, and by the way, there is the Q&A, uh, there is a Q&A button there for you. So if you have any questions, as the presentations go and you don't want to wait in the end, put it there. And then in the meantime, you will, you know, Mustafa will keep going. Oh, yeah, uh, but, absolutely. you know, the, at least it gives you a chance to sort of save it uh, and we'll know it. And then when the right time comes, you know, we'll just pick it up and, and answer that. Absolutely. And guys, uh, one thing I'll also mention, if you have a pen and paper or you've got uh, notes on your, or whatever you're watching on this tablet, uh, laptop, computer, whatever it is, try and take some notes because this presentation that I'm going to go through now, uh, it doesn't have too much detail. I'll be talking a lot. So uh, you probably want to write some of that stuff down just to save it so you can go back to it. Also, just to highlight, by the end of today, you are all more than welcome to reach out to us uh, completely free of charge so we can maybe listen to you, see how we can advise you what you can do or can't do, what's the best method of helping you out. So yes, we do. We obviously do provide a service, but that doesn't necessarily need to be that. This is completely free of charge, the advice that we'll give you. So let's get right down to it then. Tech hiring. Here we go. Uh, where's my mouse? There we go. So tech hiring. Before we start, uh, I thought um, I would bring to your attention or remind you of a concept that, you know, being entrepreneurs or professionals, you've all probably come across it before, uh, you're all very well familiar with it. You probably run it past your clients on continuous basis, uh, which is the cost quality time triangle. It's very, very important to keep this in mind um, because it's so true for hiring, just like it is for everything else. You, you have to hit your sweet spot. So if you can see my mouse, uh, the sweet spot, obviously the balance, the right balance between time to hire uh, the cost of hiring and the quality of the hire. Your sweet, every person's or every organization's sweet spot can be different from another. So there isn't one right one. However, if you stress on one or the other, you're going to have to relinquish one of the, uh, basically the third one. So if you want absolute quality, you just want quality, you're not fussed about the, you have to, you know, you're not fussed about the cost all the time, it's fine. But usually if you want quality and cost, you have to forget about the time um because you want to you want something cheap basically and you want top quality this is going to take you some time if you want something urgent but you want the top quality you know uh you're going to have to pay money unfortunately if you just care about saving money and you want something asap you're probably going to have to relinquish a bit of the quality just a reminder now we can obviously 
for one. So hiring is, um, hiring is hard. It, it, it's not easy to hire. It's one of the biggest challenges and we'll go, we'll see that throughout this presentation again. Uh, apologies in advance if I'm running too quickly. I'm just trying to give you guys as much as information here as possible. Uh, but yes, hiring is very hard. The process of hiring is hard. It's hard work, even if you completely outsource everything. So you just want to see candidates, let's just say. That's still hard work because you still have to go through the profiles one by one. And then you have to interview these people, a number of interviews, assess them, go back and discuss, then you know perhaps offer them negotiate with them back and forth. It's hard work. It is time consuming and it is expensive. I don't know if you guys can see because of my, let me, let me minimize myself. Try and just go there. Um, cool. It's quite expensive. Uh, there's no other way around it. It is, it is expensive to hire. It's not cheap. Uh, it's a challenge. Uh, but today, what I'm, I'm hoping I can at least explain to you guys or help you out is how we can reduce the expense and reduce the time it can uh, it can cost. Does it reduce the hard work? Unfortunately, it doesn't. There is no substitute for hard work. It's a cliche, but for this one, it really does apply. Um, so again, there's no magic formula. It, it doesn't exist, unfortunately. There's no such thing. So headcount planning. What is headcount planning? This is the first and most important step of anything to do with hiring. As an organization, if you want, go back here, if you want to save on time, you want to save money, and you probably don't want to work as hard in a short amount of time because the work doesn't really change, you're going to have to implement the method of headcount planning. What, what is headcount planning though? What is headcount planning? It's like the name suggests, it is planning for your hires. So I don't just say, as an organization, we just don't sit here and say, oh, we need somebody right now, or we have a project. We, we, have a new, we just landed a new project. We need people now. The whole idea is that we've planned it ahead of time. So if we want someone in January, for example, to start with us in January, we're probably already too late now. Well, not too late, but quite late to start the process. We're almost at the end of October. There is Christmas. You know, where there's not much time to start planning this. Planning this means... In a nutshell, job description. Putting together a job description. Now you might think, oh, it's a job description. How hard can it be? If you um, if you've ever watched Top Gear uh, or Grand Tour, Jeremy Clarkson, that's one of his favorite uh, sayings. How hard can it be? Pretty damn hard, as it turns out, because job description, you first need to identify the need. We must identify what it is that we actually need here. If we are simply growing, do we need junior staff? Do we need mid-level? Do we need seniors? Have we landed a new project or are we about to land a new project or a few new projects that will require more, uh, more hands, more work? Um, are we growing? Our finance team needs to grow or our marketing needs to, team needs to grow, our HR team needs to grow. Um, what, what's the deal here? Or our existing members of staff, you know, they're very good, but they're quite inexperienced and they're not necessarily the best at working together. They, they, they just cannot gel well. So we need that extra bit of experience to help them work together. So it's important to identify, which means highlighting what the experience is. Like I just mentioned, do we need a junior person, a mid-level person, senior person, an advisor, a trainee, um, a, uh, a, 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 uh, uh, an intern, for example? What do we need? We need to plan that. We need to understand that. We need to put that together. We need to set aside the budget. How much is this going to cost? Do we have the money for that? How much money are we willing to set aside? How much money can we pay this person? Because the hiring cost, remember, is not just paying for that person, as we will see. To get that person, you will have to spend some money. In most cases, you will. Um, how much money can be, can be varied, but like we will find out next, um, you know, can vary, but we still need to know how much our budget is. Then we can discuss, okay, so we have a need for somebody really senior, but we cannot take someone on board and pay them 80,000 pounds a year. We just don't have that budget. We're a startup. We don't have that budget. Or we, you know, we're scaling up. 
but that's still very fairly expensive for us. So we might not necessarily want a permanent person. We might want to take a contractor, you know, two, three days a week, really senior, and make sure that they oversee the work, everyone's working together, train them up a little bit, train one of our staff really, get them up to speed, get them to stand out, be able to take the next step in their career, maybe lead the team. So again, it's a conversation. It's a plan that we need to come up with. And then finally, when? When do we need that person to start? Now, if you think about it, the reason we say is give it three months. More often than not, in most cases, people will have a uh, notice period. This notice period, again, in most cases, is usually four weeks, which means from the moment that person hands in their resignation, which is usually after they've signed a contract with you, uh, because they, no one usually would hand in their resignation before signing something, to secure it at least, uh, they will need to work four weeks unless they can come up, you know, come to an arrangement or an agreement with their current employer. So you need to plan that. If that is just four weeks in itself, so if I want somebody starting in, again, let's just say February, we need to be starting now because one month notice, we need time to plan all this. This isn't just instant. This requires teams coming together, discussing what do we really need, et cetera, et cetera. And then we can decide on the job description. Once we have done that, we can go out and try and find that person. So it's a lot of work. But one of the things we discussed in the um, in the uh, invite page, in the event page, and you know, we actually received quite a bit of feedback from you guys uh, uh, saying this was one of the reasons you, you wanted to attend this, is the mindset of a developer. Now, again, it's a cliche, but it takes one to know one. And I suppose that's probably one of the reasons, not probably, it is one of the reasons why we at Silicon Roundabout have been really successful at doing this and helping organizations hire because we are developers. We do the job ourselves. We understand it. We are these developers, as they say. Um, but what's the mindset? How, how, how can you communicate better? First thing you need to know is not money motivated. Developers are not people you can say to them, I'll pay you 100K. Just come and come and come and join me. That that doesn't usually cut it. That's not enough. In most cases, I'm not saying everybody. In, mo in most cases, it's not enough. What's more, the word decompose is an interesting one because a developer or a tech professional, they have, or we have this. We want to break things down. We want to really break it down. If we see a piece of hardware, if we see a software, anything we see, we want to break it down and then try and put it back together. We want to see how it works, what's interesting about this. It, it's something that we want to do. And it's important when you are communicating with developers, with tech professionals, that you understand that because you need to be able to you know, communicate with them. Link that, whatever you're trying to link, you know, put it into terms that they find exciting. Problem solvers, challenges love challenges. Tech professionals just simply love challenges. It is what they look for time and time again. What is your challenge? What are you trying to solve here? As a company, what's your solution to the market? Why are you bringing? What's, what's new here? Uh, as an individual, what am I helping you solve? Why do you need me for? What's the, what, what's the problem here? How can I help you? Then there's the efficiency. Uh, Tech professionals are just simply suckers for efficiency. Uh, they don't like wasting time. They hate anything that is inefficient. And I use the word hate. Hate is a big word, but I genuinely use it here because it is so true. If a developer um, feels or notices that uh, you're going to ask them something more than once, they will need to come up with, they feel like they want to come up with a software or a code that anything to do it by itself. So they don't have to do it. So they can skip that process. Efficiency, it's all about efficiency. How can we save steps rather than go again and again and again and again? Now keep this in mind because this is gonna come very valuable later on. I'm gonna refer back to it. Finally, each is individually unique. So everything I've just told you now, that doesn't apply for everybody. It applies to most, <laughs> but what you cannot do is go up to a tech professional and say to them, you're this and this and this and this and that. They would hate that you're presuming. To you, if you are not a developer, you might think, but that's not much, there's not really much of a difference. To a developer, 
every single person is individually unique. Everything about them is so different. The way if they can write a code in a slightly different way, that's enough. And you have to, you know, work to that. You have to work towards that and understand that rather than just get everybody, okay, fine, we're just, you know, you're all developers and put them all in the same basket. Doesn't work. You kind of offend them and you get on the wrong page and yeah, just don't do it. So ways of hiring. How do we hire? What, what, what are different ways of hiring? Now, this is going to be a bit of a generalist uh, slide, but you know, entertain me for a bit. We'll get into that. First of all, direct sourcing. What does that mean? Direct sourcing, it means us reaching out to individuals. Us literally calling people, reaching out to people one at a time. Not necessarily, you know, um, referrals and so on. This is different. It's us reaching out to people. Okay, so you sitting down every day, using certain methods, which we'll talk about, and try to reach out to people. Then there's job adverts. When you're writing a job advert, people can come to you. Another method of hiring people. To many, job adverts don't really work, but they do. And we'll talk about that later. Referrals. Uh, referrals are a huge, huge way of hiring people because it saves you money and it saves you time. You don't have to reach out to people, start one by one, you know, to get to gauge their interest. If somebody refers you to someone, they just connect you with them. Then there you go. You don't have to spend money on that, and you've saved time. You can simply engage with that person. Then there's outsourcing, as in getting an organization or recruiters or anyone, even you know, people like us, for example, so around about anyone, any external source to do that for you on your behalf. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they will have the hiring decision or the ability to make the hiring decision. They simply connect you with the people. The decision is eventually, essentially yours. Direct sourcing, job boards, social media, headhunting, and uh, having an internal team. So we'll talk about that briefly. Again, I'm conscious of time. Um, job boards is you getting access to a CV library online, such as read, CV library, job site, or total jobs. They're technically the same thing. Indeed, a monster. Uh, but where to start? Which one is right for you? Which one it isn't? Actually, each job board, funny enough, is best for a specific type of caliber, a specific type of candidates or professionals. Uh, and funny enough, they, these tend to change over the years. Uh, ones I would probably advice, and I'm not saying they are bad, it's just if you're recruiting for tech, they're probably not the best places to try, would be Monster and Indeed. Just not the best, um, you know, seek other subscriptions. But that means you yourself have to sit down and look through and do their own search. And you need to know how you're searching. So if you don't know how to search, to search, to search for people, this is obsolete, you're just wasting money. If you don't have anybody, if you don't have an internal talent team, for example, or not necessarily a team, but a HR person, an internal recruiter, someone who can do this job is quite obsolete because, you know, you're not going to get anywhere. You've just paid money. You have a CV database, but you can't really use it. Um, social media. I think that just sells itself, really. Social media, Twitter, Instagram. However, you can reach out to people uh, on social media. Usually for tech people, it's usually GitHub or Stack Overflow. Uh, but again, if you can't navigate those, then you, you'll struggle with that. Headhunting is you going people after the people directly. Now, oh, sorry, sorry, which links with social media, LinkedIn as well, uh, or Zing if you're working in or you're looking for people in Germany. Uh, LinkedIn is a very powerful tool, but the issue with LinkedIn is that it's become a recruiter's hunting ground. All recruiters sit on LinkedIn. Most tech professionals just don't respond to that because recruiters just simply give you endless messages and you, 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 they can't respond. They just, they can't be asked and they can't respond to all of it. But I am not a developer now, haven't been for a long time and I still get tons of messages of, you know, job offers, offers or job descriptions or adverts saying you're interested in this job front end, back end, whatever the role is. And it doesn't even apply to me. So, you know, this is the downside of LinkedIn, which you need to be aware of. Headhunting, however, is you going after people directly 
on LinkedIn or through companies. So uh, if you're daring enough, you reach out to them at work and you try and headhunt them. But again, if you don't have that skill, if you don't, if you've never done the job, probably not something you would want to do or you can do, in fact. Adverts. Uh, I want to talk about quickly the downside of adverts. And then I'll talk about the upsides, like the upsides, what you can do to improve later on down the line. Boring. Don't, don't write any boring adverts. Adverts cannot be boring because most adverts are boring and you're not going to stand out. And if you just type any job title into any job board, have a look at how many adverts you're going to come across. The first probably 10 pages are full of it. Um, why? Because all recruitment agencies simply post the same job advert again and again and again and again and again, and they just simply fill the job board with it. Um, so you need to stand out. Do not copy and paste the job description because most people these days, excuse me, they look at jobs or adverts, they see them uh, on their phones. Yes, now it's Corona, so no one's really using, or not many people are using public transport anymore. Uh, lots of people are on their laptops, but still the fact that if an advert is very long, people aren't going to read it. If it's a copy paste job description, they just won't bother with it. No one does. Um, don't try and be self-centered. You're probably, if you're here, you're probably not a PwC or an Apple or a Google or an Amazon. So, I mean, hopefully you're not an Amazon because as an employer, they're not the best. Uh, but uh, you can't be self-centered. You need to attract these people. These people need to really feel that it's about them, okay? And you want them and you're engaging with them. As they like, again, can't be too long, just like a copy paste job description. Don't make it paragraph, 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 paragraph. It's just, it's too much. They won't even read it. What you will get, the downside, you'll get so many different applications from people who haven't read it. Uh, they most likely don't even match what you're looking for. Uh, yeah, again, I, I cannot say that. I've said that, I've probably, probably said it in each one of those time and time again. Too long. It cannot be too long. It has to be punchy, succinct, and engaging. Referrals. Um, so I've, I've gone through it straight, you know, I've, I've tried to hurry up quite a bit here. Um, you can really use referral schemes uh, in, by first of all, by creating schemes. So you can either reach out to your contacts in the industry, as we all know, or you simply establish a referral scheme. So if an employee, for example, refers somebody to you and you hire them, they get, uh, they get uh, a financial reward or any sort of reward, a gym membership, anything, if they've succeeded. But what you don't want to do is create a culture where, in a way, they are to blame if that person doesn't work out. So it doesn't have to be their friend. You need to highlight that. If an employee comes up to you with someone, it doesn't need to be their friend. If they've referred you to someone, it doesn't matter whether they know them or not. Who cares? If they've referred, you've connected you with someone, thank you. If we hire them, you get your reward. Don't pressure them into doing it. They need to do it willingly. Um, and if they don't do it just because they're not encouraged enough or because they feel they cannot submit someone because they don't, they don't want to take the blame. And you certainly cannot you know, make them take the blame. So you need to highlight that to them. You're not under pressure. If you give us somebody, no problem at all. If they don't work out, it's nothing to do with you whatsoever. We hired them. We made the decision. We take full responsibility for that. If anything, thank you for connecting us to them. Simple as that. Outsourcing. So what do we mean by that? That could be independent recruiters, contractors, or recruitment agencies. Now, independent recruiters and recruitment agencies are very similar because... Um, they both will charge you a fee per hire usually, um, but independent recruiters are usually not a big agency and you get more, a bit more of a personal touch with them. And uh, they tend to be, you know, in most cases, you can negotiate their rates cheaper. Uh, contractors are people you hire on site. If you want to, if you know you're going to have, you're going to have an increase in hiring demands, basically you're going to, be hiring five, six, seven, eight people in the next quarter or uh, two quarters, for example, then you know you could consider the idea of having a contractor on site. These people can probably charge you somewhere from upwards of 150 pounds a day. Uh, but again, it's only worth it if you know you're going to have a lot of people. You need to hire a lot of people. 
they're contractors, they're being paid by the day, they don't get paid a bonus. Uh, so you would need to really have, they need to have the work cut out for them. They need to have a lot of work for that. Agencies and independent recruiters, they get paid a fee. Now, and I will talk about this uh, also later on, I'll touch upon that later on. Uh, be very careful here, because when you enter an agreement with a recruitment agency and independent, and independent recruiters, if you sign an agreement, what you cannot do is think, oh, I'm just going to be too clever, you know, we, we, we sign something and then maybe we don't necessarily um, honor the agreement in, 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 in whatever way possible. Don't be too clever. These are legally binding and uh, they could take you to court and you could end up paying a lot more than just their fees. So be very careful here. Uh, recruitment agencies and independent recruiters, as well as contractors, in most cases, the downside here is that, well, the upside, sorry, you're getting a recruiter who uses the, uh, you know, the job boards, the social media, they know how to use the tools. The problem is, that's all they do. Most of them, at least. There isn't really a tech experience, expertise. There isn't really a tech knowledge, you'll probably speak to so many different different agencies and recruiters and they'll tell you, I'm an expert, I'm a specialist in this and this and this and that. Recruitment agencies do not train their staff on, how, on tech. They just don't know tech. That's the reality of it. They don't understand it enough. Uh, it's a common theme, in fact, in Silicon Roundabout. It's a recruiter-free environment. Recruitment consult or agencies or recruiters are simply not allowed in the, uh, in, 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 in the uh, community. Why? Because our people don't like recruiters. They don't uh, understand them. So the recruiters, they don't understand the candidates, the tech professionals. Again, it takes a developer to understand developer. Like you said, the developer mindset. They don't understand that. They don't understand the job itself because they've not done it. Again, I'm not attacking the recruiters here. It's not actually a person's fault. They're very, very good at finding profiles, locating them. How? By searching for buzzwords. C sharp, Java, JavaScript, senior, blah, blah, blah. They're very good at that, but that's all they do. They cannot really interview somebody and get, you know, really understand whether they're good enough at their job or not. Their prices, they tend to be circa the 20% mark, which means they usually would charge you 20% of the person's first year salary. Now, if, if you should never pay that much anyway, but that tends to be the average. Some can go as low as 18 or even 15%, but that's still very expensive. To put it into perspective, for example, when we work with uh, organizations, when we've helped startups or scale-ups hire for people, uh, if it's usually, the, the, the highest we would ever charge them is 10%. But the idea is that we never charge you, we don't want to charge you per role. The whole idea is that we work with you from start to finish to establish everything. And then it is merely a flat fee Success. It's an entire project. You need two, three, whatever people, then it's a flat fee. Under 10%, it will work out to be. So you shouldn't have to pay more than that. Uh, but again, like I said, they're very good at doing that, finding people, buzzwords, technicality, quality, probably not so much. One thing to be very careful here if you are desperate for time, don't... Um, Please, 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 like I am asking you on behalf of, <laughs> I don't know what, do not go out to one, two, three, four, five different agencies or recruiters. Just don't do that. What you're doing, you're literally dragging your name through the mud. Because what will happen here, every recruitment agency you will speak with, they will take your job description, write an advert about it. It'll be a very badly written advert because they know it's a competitive thing and they just want to get you the right people in front of you. And they're going to go ahead and place an advert and they're going to contact every single candidate they can possibly come across on the phone. Now, the people who are on the job boards, these people will be contacted by all the agencies who have you, who technically you've reached out to. So they've been approached by several agencies. You will end up eventually in a legal battle between which one of them presented your uh, candidate first, which you really don't want to get into because you just want the right person. B, the developers hate dealing with too many recruitment agencies. They just don't like dealing with agencies in the first place, and they're along with you. And if they get the same job through several agencies, they'll just pull out. They're, they're not interested anymore because it shows that you really aren't on top of things. And that speaks a huge volume. That speaks volumes to the tech professionals, and that's important to them. So don't work with, a, with, with several ones. And if you are going to work with one, 
please, please, please do your digging, really test their knowledge. Really, if they don't understand tech, how can they possibly get you the right people? I'm not saying they can't because obviously this is a flourishing industry. It's over 40 billion pounds, uh, sorry, 30 billion pounds. But it's when it comes to tech, it's not just buzzwords, especially for you guys. If you're a startup and you scale up, you need the right people, not just anybody. Uh, do we have a question here? How do you qualify a recruiter is good? Test their tech knowledge. What's their tech background? What do you want them to recruit for? Um, is it a, uh, you know, like if, if it's for, for accounting, whether for HR, for tech, I'm talking about tech here. So if they don't have the right tech criteria, not a single tech qualification, no experience as a tech professional, then how would they know? Can they hold a conversation? Sometimes if, they've, if you've not done the actual job, it's fine, but you have a rel relatively good understanding of it. You need to understand that. If you can't, as a problem here, uh, you need to reach out to your tech staff. If, again, we're more than happy to give you a free of charge service, just come back to us. We're happy to help you determine who would be good if someone is good enough or not. You don't need to use us at all. Feel free, use our, take our advice. Whether you use it or not, it's up to you, but just listen to our advice. Um, so does that, I hope that answers the question. Um, so I'm not gonna keep on talking about this because we can, go, we can, we can talk forever on this. So moving on, um, what happened here? Okay, this is very important because regard, the candidate experience and employer branding, because regardless of what method you use to actually attract people or identify people, uh, this is crucial to have. And only you can do that. You have to have that. We, as a Silicon Roundabout, we actually can help you with that. Uh, but nonetheless, it will take, it, it's not something we do for free, quite frankly. It's something as part of the package, part of us, a bigger project where we really work with you and partner you and present you to the community. You know, we can talk about that, but this is not what we're here to talk about. Uh, not us. It's talking about how you can, you know, tackle these two things. Employer branding is different from your brand as a company. Completely different, very different. This is how you are seen as an employer, how people talk about you, how developers and tech professionals talk about you basically, or not just tech professionals, but any professionals. Why is it important? Because 54% of negative experience impacts the decision-making. If I'm a candidate and I didn't like uh, the experience I've had through with you as an applicant, it will, it will definitely impact my decision-making. I will decide, I will choose if I'm fine, if I'm basically arrived at the final stage with two companies and I have two offers, I will most certainly choose the one that I've had better process with. You know, 54% choose, they say that the negative will impact that. It will do for me, for sure, in many people that I know, it, it, it simply is the case. So you need to ensure that you have the right experience, candidate experience, sorry, the good positive candidate experience. 69% uh, will not apply again. By the way, for references on percentages, so you don't think I'm just talking out of the back of my head, I'm more than happy to send them to you, reach out to us, I'll send you the links and references that we use as well. 64%, uh, they're less likely to purchase goods and services from the employer. Uh, do research this, by the way. Don't just take, oh, sorry. Uh, do research this. Don't listen to me here. Don't just take it from me. But uh, <laughs> Virgin Media or Virgin, uh, they it was costing them estimated £4 million annually. Bad candidate experience. It was costing them business because of this. 64% of people with negative experience makes them less likely to purchase goods or services from an employer. Definitely look this up. It's version. I'm not talking from the back of my head. Uh, I'll be more than happy to send you links. Four pillars. We're very we're running short on time, so I'll be you know I'll try to hurry up uh, so I can give you guys room for questioning at the end. Four pillars of candidate experience. Candidate is king. Oh, can you see that? I hope you can see that. Yep. So 65% of recruiters say that talent shortage is the biggest hiring challenge. It is so true. And if it, that wasn't the case, you guys wouldn't be here right now anyway. So you know it's true. Uh, filling the vacancy, efficiency, and feedback. So I'll talk about that very briefly. Candidate is king. You have to treat candidates as king. You can't just say, you, you're not doing the world a favor by having a vacancy. There's plenty 
out there. Yes, it's COVID right now. Yes, it's an absolute crisis. But this is a crisis which the world is going through at the moment, and it will soon emerge out of that. How soon? Whether We don't know whether you are a believer or not, whatever, but you know the world is not doing so well at the moment. And once we are starting to go out of that, these rules will simply apply again. Filling the vacancy number two. What I mean by that is you're, we're not supposed to just simply put a process and follow it blindly. The process is supposed to help make our lives easier to, in finding the right people, not to make sure they follow that process to the letter because that's just simply our process. Three, it needs to be efficient. We'll talk about that in a second. Don't make them go, jump through one hoop after another, after another, after another, after another. It, developers love efficiency. If you make an inefficient process, they'll jump. It's important statistic here that plus 70 plus percent of candidates are passive. That means they are passive. They're not really actively looking. So if they're not interested, or if they find that your process is a bit too long, or your advert isn't really that interesting, or you, whatever it is, your employer's brand, brand employer image isn't really that interesting, they're just not going to apply. They won't. Finally, feedback, which is crucial. And you cannot get that wrong, because it is the downfall of so many different organizations. So candidate experience, employee branding, it goes into, if we decided, if we said these are the four pillars, the foundation, let's say, then to have a decent candidate experience, we'll have five phases to that. Starting with phase one, which is the attraction phase. Then the application phase, the selection phase, the onboarding phase, and finally the retention phase. So briefly, we'll go through every single one of them. Attraction phase, which is the initial contact between an employer and the applicant, okay? Job advert or marketing campaign, or even a phone call, the attraction. So on average, there are 56 applicants applications per advert, but 2% of applicants are actually interviewed. Scary statistic, because that usually means most of the people that are actually, um, either it means you found your people straight away, fantastic. Let's be honest, that's not really the case. It's because not everybody who applies are relevant or right for a job. So the advert isn't really right. So what you want to do is you want to hook them by selling the job. Yes, you might not be someone who's good at sales, but if you want to attract the right people, you have to use the right bait. You need to sell the job to them. It is important if you're not, let's just say, good at, you know, uh, writing an advert, use a copywriter, okay? Pay a copywriter to write an advert. Obviously, if you want to reduce cost, then that could be a good way to start with. Initially, you pay a copywriter, they write you an advert, and you advertise it, and you see what comes. Um, it's like going fishing. You need the right bait. You need the right tools. You need to be in the right pond. In other words, fishing in the right pond, which means advertising in the right job boards, um, otherwise, you know, if you go and just simply apply on uh, advertise on Indeed, you'll probably get lots of people who are not necessarily relevant. Uh, but either way, you have to really sell the job. Application, which is the process of how applicants submit their interest in their job. That 40% no cover letter means rejection. So a lot of companies request a cover letter. What's well, interesting, actually, a lot of companies these days, you know, uh, because they're modern companies, they don't necessarily ask for a um, cover letter. What they do is something similar, basically. They give you a list of questions and they want their answers one at a time. The scary thing is 26% actually read the cover letters or the answers. Don't get them to jump through hoops. That's long. That's just lengthening the process. There's nothing wrong with asking these questions. But later, once you've established interest, once you've had a conversation, initially, you lose so many people. They just drop out. They won't be interested. Cover letters are long. They take forever. It's not by saying, but we want somebody who really wants the job. Why, why would they want to work for you specifically? If you haven't built your brand yet, if you haven't built your employer brand, like I said, you're not an Apple, you're not a PwC, you're not a Google. Otherwise, we wouldn't be having this conversation today. We need to appeal to these people especially tech professionals, appeal them, the challenge, the interest. What's so cool here? How could, what can you learn? Okay, how can you develop? How can you take yourself further? Progress as a, as a professional. You definitely don't let them make them write cover letters and answer so many different questions before they even get the chance to speak to you. 
long process, 60% of candidates will leave if it's a long process. They just won't continue with it because they can't be asked. Candidates are five times more likely to you, uh, exit the process during the pre-screening questions. It's, it's a fact. It's not something that we make up. Don't get them to jump through many, too many hoops. You need to really do the job here. Like I said, it is not easy hiring. It's hard work. If you're not doing it yourself, someone else is. Either the in-house team or the outsource agency or the uh, contractor or so look around the if it's us. <laughs> Whoever is doing it, it's hard work. Application feedback. 75% of applicants never receive feedback, never hear back from the company. 95%, they want, they, 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 95 percent of people want or highlight that understanding of how to follow up an, an application is a primary reason or a primary, um, what's the word? Well, yeah, reason to make them apply for this. If they feel they cannot follow up or chase up their application, they won't apply. So you really need to say you can chase up by having a phone number, having an email. Now, they are, the downside of that is that you'll get a lot of recruitment agencies contacting you true but you know you have to give away for them to really reach out to you if not you're that more likely for them to not apply and if and it's while it's so hard for you to reach out to everybody we are really running out of time here to reach out to everybody and give feedback to everyone who actually applies to you uh you most certainly need and must reply or get back to those uh who have reached out to you directly so if those who apply, fair enough, you might have 50, 60 adverts, oh, sorry, responses. I appreciate it's very hard. But what you need to do is at least get back to those who get in touch directly. Not ignore them, not give them a generalist feedback. If your CV is right, we'll get back to you. No, you need to give them a real response. These people will take that feedback and they will write it and they will talk. And the tech community is not exactly that massive. You might think, oh, it's, we have so many developers around. Well, if there were, you wouldn't be here today and these people talk to each other. We know we have a community who hates recruiters. Most of them aren't really on social media. So, you know, they talk to each other. We, we, we know them. If you want to reach out to them, for example, it's either through us or if you know them directly or through referrals and they talk. People in the tech community, they talk to each other. They might not be present on social media, but they will definitely drop some feedback here and there just to highlight their experience. Selection. Huge, huge part. I will really rush through this uh, because I want to give you guys a chance to ask as many questions as possible. 39% of HR managers spend less than a minute looking at CV and 19% spend less than 30 seconds. So something about tech professionals is, unless we're talking about front-end developers, they don't really place that higher value on their CV. They just, it doesn't really, it's not a huge thing. It's something that the employer wants, but they can't be asked to do it. They don't like it. You know, you can't judge me on my CV, judge me on my work, on what I've done. So you can't really spend such little time reading it or making a judgment very quickly. Read it. Try and see what this person is saying. Hiring is hard, like I said. Um, and if you have an AI, like a software that does it, crucial. Absolutely crucial because it's no different than a recruiter who doesn't really understand tech and is just literally matching words. Bad, very bad. Most of the people who have we have helped find jobs, and we're talking about senior people, CTOs, very experienced people, never had a CV. We had to help them put something together to send to the company when we connected them together, and they ended up getting the job. To, for tech professionals, that is not the most important thing. So you really need to understand that. Um, if you're a hiring manager, you really need to work with whoever's recruiting for that job. If it's your internal team, someone like us, agencies, for example, you need to work with them. You can't just not give feedback because that makes it that much harder for them to actually give you the service that you want, for them to provide you with the right profile, for you to come across the right profile. If it's your internal team, you, you need to respond. You can't just think, my day job is to do one thing. Hiring is part of your job. It is part of your job. The fact that you've arrived there means you need it. It means it needs to be done. The more interactive you are, the more available you make yourself to be to these people, the better it is and the more swift the process can be. Ideally, don't, don't um, make it more than three uh, stage process. Initial stage, hi, hello, how are you doing? Get to know the person very quickly. Second stage, maybe hiring manager conversation, maybe a, um, 
uh, if you want to really test their experience. And finally, just the, you know, you have to meet with the CTO or CEO or whoever it is more senior or meet the team, for example. But no more than that, not back and forth, back and forth. One thing worth noting is, is a practical assessment ess essential? If you are a tech professional, if you're a hiring manager, a tech hiring manager, you probably can find out really throughout the conversation whether someone is good enough or not. If you are going to do a practical assessment, don't give it at the start. Give it at the end. Second stage, part of the second part of the interview process, but a second stage. Um, not you know at the very start before they're even interested. One thing worth noting also is this little, sorry, where is it? This little, the hiring managers. Are they trained on interviewing? That is a crucial skill. Interviewing is not just, oh yeah, I speak to someone and I do the job and I know what they are. No. There's a reason why people get trained on how to interview. There's a reason that is part of HR professionals, for example, um, qualifications, so on. Interviewing itself is a job. You need to know how to interview people, how to get the best out of them. Okay, it's very important. The questions, the right questions to ask. Otherwise, you know, and you know, obviously to get them interested in the job. Um, otherwise, then you know, it will the communication will just fall apart. Onboarding, very quickly, 88% um, of employees always say that uh, onboarding programs are just simply not good enough. So just because you hired someone, remember what we said at the start, if this is part of the budget, this is part of the planning. If somebody joins, are we ready for them? Okay, what, how are they gonna be, how are they gonna gel into the right company? Uh, how are they gonna be, sorry, gel into our company? Um, the first six months are crucial because that's what decides if somebody stays or not. Um, and if there's no training, no onboarding, you can bet that they're probably going to be on their way out. Finally, retention. Literally, to keep these people interested, I'm not going to go into that because that's a, literally a workshop in itself. But you need to emphasize on the challenges. They always make. They always have challenges to work with. They are working on their personal, uh, sorry, professional development. They're learning. They're training. They're improving. There's progression whether it's in skill, whether it's in career. And, you know, money doesn't hurt either. They can't be on the same level uh, of salary for a year and a half, two years, blah, blah, blah. These need to be increased uh, on, uh, you know, regular basis, annual basis, whenever, however often you review them. Um, okay, so I'm so sorry we have hit the time. Does anybody have any questions whatsoever? I know I've talked for top five to one. As I said, it's a crash course. Um, you can always reach out to us, by the way, to uh, help you out, to give you some advice, what can be done, what can't be done, et cetera, et cetera. Um, oh, I'm not sure. Francesco, if you can hear me, are we getting questions? Yes, yes I can. Uh, well, I saw that question in the answer in the Q&A that you already replied to, which was uh, how do you qualify a recruiter? But didn't you get a couple of questions ahead of the event? Um, I did. So the questions, by the way, the questions that we... I've received, I tried to answer most of them in this. I really can't answer all of them. Uh, we'll try to get back to you individually with that, but please reach out to us if you have specific questions. Otherwise, look, we're free. I'm happy to take any questions, as many as you want right now. Um, so, you know, just 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 fire away. I'm trying to even hear any questions, so does it? Oh, I'm going to stop the recording in the meantime. Okay. Uh, but yeah, you know, we can continue with the Q&A if you're free, Safi.